And the passage is Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. Okay, I'll begin. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then you will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Pastor William will give the message. All right, good morning, everyone. Yeah, uh, as you can see, we don't have as many people here today because we have a, a JBF HBF conference going on right now, and many people are at this conference. So um, nonetheless, we have a, a, a worship service here. So, um, you know, um, today is the last day of the um, Matthew uh, chapter 25. Um, back in April 3rd of 2022, we set off to look at the five sermons of Jesus found in Matthew's gospel. Uh, this is over 400, maybe 500 days ago, 400 days ago. Um, and about... Uh, oh, I counted it was, it was somewhere between, um, it's about 60 messages, 60 Sunday worship services that we had to cover these. So today is the final uh, installment of, of the uh, seven discourse or five discourses of Jesus in Matthew's gospel. Thank God. Uh, as I was uh, preparing, I was thinking about all the things that I learned personally, and I was just, I felt so enriched from going through Jesus' teaching in these uh, five discourses. So let's finish, uh, uh, let's pray to finish strong today. Amen. <laughs> so the title of today's message is Least of Them. It comes from Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Our key verse is 40. Okay. Let me read this for us. And, um, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. When I was growing up, um, my grandfather um, had a, uh, on my mom's side, had a lot of uh, pocket knives. <laughs> um, my, my son uh, can attest to this, that when he went up to my grandmother's house, his great-grandmother, he found a treasure trove of pocket knives. Um, the thing is that a lot of these pocket knives are very, very old, and so like they're antiques, right, of high value. But really, when you look at these uh, pocket knives, they, a lot of them have this in common which is that the, uh, the tips are broken off of a lot of these pocket knives. They have very dull blades, and, but mostly when that, you know, a dull blade you can sharpen, but uh, when the tip's gone, uh, it's, it's a, big, a big issue. It really reminds us that the tip, sometimes a small detail can make all the difference in the functionality, the usefulness, the effectiveness of something. In today's passage, we're going to see a a tip 
of a very important concept in Jesus' teaching called the least of them. I think when a church goes through a hard time, a uh, spiritual attack or kind of degrades or decays, this point found in today's passage can be one of the first things that gets lost or broken off from a church. And that is an understanding, an appreciation, a love and focus on the least of them. So with this in mind, let's kind of think about this uh, concept and its critical role that it plays in our life and in the life of a church, the least of them. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for blessing us with this time that we can um, uh, pray to finish the uh, five discourses of Matthew's gospel, uh, really understanding uh, Jesus' emphasis on the least of them. Uh, Lord, in this world, according to the patterns of this world, the strong, the powerful, those who are independent, and, uh, and uh, they're the ones that get the focus. But Lord Jesus, that was not your focus. Your focus was on the least of them. You understood the need. You saw it. You died for it. Um, help us to remove the pattern of this world and to take into heart this pattern that focuses on the least of them. We thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, part one. Sheep and goats. Let's, let's go ahead and look at verses 31 to 33. Let's read these verses responsibly. I'll go first. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. So Jesus begins uh, today's passage um, with this expression or this sentence, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. This, of course, is very much uh, shows the, the end of all things. Jesus is going to conclude this world by sitting on his glorious throne and with all the heavenly hosts, all the angels with him, the divine powers in the heavenly realms and um, and he'll sit on this throne, and he's going to do something that's very, very important. He is going to separate. He's going to make a distinction. We saw this uh, concept back when Jesus gave many parables about the, um, the church, and especially the, the parable of the wheat and the tares. In this time that we currently live in, there's a lot of mixture. There's a lot of affordance for people to not be ID'd or separated from one another because, as we learn in that parable, the wheat and the tares, some people might be uprooted prematurely. This time, before Jesus sits on his glorious throne, is a huge opportunity to be changed, to be somebody who was evil and be converted over to somebody who is good. Of course, this is only done through faith in Jesus. But it should be appreciated that the end has not come yet. We live in the time of grace, where judgment has not fallen down on anyone. And everyone who is alive can have a chance to repent and change and be changed. However, the time is going to come where the separation will occur, where there won't be time to transition from being a, a tear to a wheat or from a goat to a sheep, as we'll see in today's passage. So this pa passage has a lot of hope and a lot of teaching for our current time of grace, where maybe if we haven't been following Jesus closely, we can begin to follow him really closely in preparation for this day when Jesus will sit on his glorious throne. But let's look what's going to happen when he sits on his glorious throne. It says in verse 32, before him will be gathered all the nations, all people, not a single person missing. And he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now, I have to kind of put a little bit of a uh, disclaimer here. This passage is, has a lot of um, end times, what we call like eschatology uh, interpretations. 
there's a lot of viewpoints about like when this will happen, who exactly is involved, is it, is it, is it really everybody? Why does it say nations here? Um, we're not gonna focus on that today. It's worthwhile to look into. Instead, we're gonna focus on the principles that are universal for any time. But I did wanna make that point that there is a lot more to this passage as far as it fits into an end times perspective. But what I love about Jesus' teaching is whether you uh, fit things into the right order of things, if you learn the principles and follow the principles, you're safe no matter what. So what is the principle that we see here? Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. I'm so excited to share this next part with you. I've learned so much about sheep and goats. <laughs> um, a shepherd oftentimes will have uh, sheep and goats in his herds. It was the case with Jacob. It's the case with, um, with um, Abraham and, and Isaac as well. Sheep and goats, they're very interesting because although um, they're, one's called a sheep, one calls a goat, they actually have a lot of similarities with each other. For example, the first similarity is that they really do look the same in the face. Especially if you were to take a sheep, and I, I read that if you take a sheep and you shear it right after it's sheared and its coat is a lot shorter, definitely from a distance, sheep really do look a lot like goats, and, and goats look a lot like sheep. So they visually look the same. In fact, if you were to look at their classification, you know, as far as uh, scientific classification, they're very similar. They have, they have the same... Uh, uh, family and it, only at certain level, at the, at the closest level, do they separate into two distinct groups as far as classification is concerned. So another similarity is not just how they look, but also, this is a big one, they both have a very strong herding nature. You can herd goats, you can herd sheep. And as a result, they find themselves under the care of shepherds. You know, shepherds... Um, can communicate and lead both sheep and goats. That can't be said for a lot of other animals, like leopards and bears and rabbits and wolves and all so many. You can't shepherd most animals. So it's actually pretty amazing that both sheep and goats are shepherd shepherdable. <laughs> You know, obviously goats are going to, you know, be negative in today's passage, but I want to I highlight the fact that how similar they are and the fact that they'll listen to the shepherd is a real important distinction. It's a very, sim a very strong similarity with the sheep. Now, also, um, both of these uh, animals have what we saw several uh, passages ago, a cloven foot. Um, sheep and goats have both a cloven foot hoof and a horses, for example, don't, don't have that split hoof. And what that split hoof really does is makes them walk a certain way. It gives them a certain agility and a carefulness and um, precision in how they walk. Both sheep and goats can walk the same. They look the same. They're both shepherd shepherdable and they both have a similar gait or way that they walk, a precision to their walk. The, uh, the third similarity is that they're both ruminants. This means that they have uh, multiple stomachs. We saw this in both uh, uh, with the clean and unclean animals. In the case of, of ruminants, they have four stomachs, um, as you can see outlined here. And the biggest part of their stomach is the, with the section called the rumen, which is where we get the concept of ruminate to think deeply about something. Or the second definition is of a ruminant uh, to chew the cud. They both really digest their food. Sheep digest the food very deeply and thoughtfully, <laughs> and so do the goats. So in this way, they're very similar to each other. They look the same. They both listen to a shepherd. They walk very similarly, and they digest very similarly. 
their similarities are really significant. And that's why dividing them is a precise action by the shepherd. But let's think about the differences real quick. The differences of, of, between a sheep and the goat is not insignificant either, though. For example, uh, let's talk about their food. The sheep is what we call a grazer, and the, uh, the uh, goat is what's called a forager. A grazer, for the most part, looks down and eats whatever's put in front of them. For example, if their sheep are taken out to a uh, green pasture, they'll just look down and eat whatever's put in front of them. <laughs> Goats, on the other hand, I found are foragers. They're always exploring, pushing boundaries, eating weird stuff. And, uh, you know, they like to, like, climb up and reach for things to eat. They're constantly pushing the perimeter of their area, whereas sheep just look down and eat what's right before them. For this reason, uh, goats are known as uh, garbage disposals. For instance, this, sheep, this goat here uh, is eating a banana peel. <laughs> He's not even eating a banana. He's eating a banana peel. They'll eat anything for the most part. Goats will. So their, their way that they eat things. So they both are very, uh, they both digest with four stomachs. But what they eat, how they go about eating is very different. Next, uh, production. Very different in production. What, what they're useful for. You know, of course, a sheep is useful for its wool, and goats are pre predominantly uh, kept by shepherds for their milk. You know, when a sheep um, has its wool and, it, and its wool gets uh, taken uh, off of them, you know, as you can see the before and after here, that wool is put through a different kind of process where, you know, it, be, it gets refined and then eventually put into, uh, into yarn in this example, and then, and then created, it creates a fabric for humans. This is why they're useful. It's kind of amazing, especially in Jesus' time, that because of all the um, sheep and the wool, men, the wool industry and, and how clothing was primarily pulled from, from a certain, uh, like, an, like an animal, like a sheep, you know, you would have many people wearing wool garments, especially the outer coat was primarily wool because of the, the heat, the ability to retain heat. And so in some ways, when I was really thinking about this, a lot of people were like, Sheep, like you are wearing sheep's clothing and kind of gives me the impression like you're a sheep. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking, whoa, that's very interesting because remember Jacob, what did he wear? He wore goat hair. Um, goat hair is not good to wear. It's not product. It's not a, something that you keep goats for. You can wear it. You can wear goat skins like Jacob. But primarily, as far as production is concerned, sheep are kept for their wool, which creates clothing for people to wear, whereas goats are not uh, known for that. Goats, though, uh, do produce milk, and that milk is far, tastes far better than sheep milk. Sheep milk, also, you can, uh, you can capture that and drink that, too. But goat's milk tastes far better, and they produce far more than uh, sheep. As a result, you can pick up goat's milk at a lot of grocery stores. If you didn't know this, there's a lot of subtle points that I'm making here. Uh, but the next one is kind of obvious. Horns. Sheep have uh, what's called pulled. They're pulled, which means that they don't have horns. And um, goats are, oops, they're what you call... Okay, there it is. Um, goats are horned or unpulled. Um, obviously, some sheep do have horns, but most do not. Um, some wild sheep have horns, like the ram, you know, like you see, like, uh, like the, the L.A. rams, right? But most sheep, especially ones that are kept, do not have horns. They're, they're pulled, whereas goats are horned. And definitely those goats use those horns. And throughout the Bible... Horns really represent a kind of power, a kind of strength, and even authority. So most sheep, no power, no authority. Whereas goats exercise power 
and authority through their horns, especially against each other. Uh, last uh, point is their dependence. Sheep are very dependent, whereas goats are very independent. In fact, um, as I was researching this, I found that goats have to, you have to really tighten up your fence with, if, you, if you have goats. Somebody, uh, this one shepherd said, uh, he, this stood out to me, he said, if it won't hold water, it won't hold a goat. <laughs> that means that goats are always pushing the boundaries. Sheep, you just kind of put a general fence around them and they'll just stay in the area, no problem. Goats, you really have to create a very tight matrix in order to hold them in. They're always trying to push out of the boundaries. So that's their dependence. Um, sheep, very dependent. Goats, independent. So when we look at these uh, differences, we saw that the difference is that eating, what they eat, how they eat, their production, sheep create wool, goats create milk, horns, and then their dependency. So that's a kind of a important background about sheep and goats that Jesus' people that he was giving this uh, to definitely knew, but maybe we're not quite as familiar with. So before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. There is a lot of similarities between sheep and goats, a lot of good similarities. But the differences in this moment create a separation between these two groups. Even though that they were all put together in the same herd and were mixed together, the time came to separate the sheep from the goats. Verse 33 says, And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. This is, a, this is an important uh, concept here because we have here a right and a left being shown. He'll place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. As we're going to see later in this passage, there's a lot of language that the sheep on the right are going to be told, come, whereas the goats on the left are going to be told, depart. So there's a bringing in closer and a pushing away farther. This, once again, really gives us an, a concept, an idea about what is the current state of affairs. Today, we find ourselves in a very neutral position. What do I mean by that? We're neither being brought in with the come, but we're also, no one's being told, depart, being pushed away. Now is the time of grace where there is not this element of the sheep being brought in closer and then the goats being pushed away farther. This hasn't happened yet. It's a neutral situation. A great moment, a great moment of opportunity to really live as Jesus' sheep, as we're going to see in this passage. Separating a sheep from goats is not uh, only found in this part of the Bible. There's actually a lot of complexity in serving flocks, and Ezekiel 34 really uh, touches on this point. I think that this is an important passage that definitely Jesus had in mind because he wrote Ezekiel 34 also. And so I want to share because it augments our understanding of this concept that we see in today's passage. Let me read it for us. As for you, Ezekiel 34, 17 to 24, as for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture and to drink of clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? So what he's, what he's basically saying here is that there's good pasture and there's clear water, but there's certain animals, certain uh, parts in, this, in his flock that are muddying, muddying up the pasture, um, or sorry, muddying up the water and treading down the pasture. He continues, uh, and must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet? 
Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns, till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Uh, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. Amen. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Ezekiel 34 shows us that it isn't just a separation between sheep and goats. There was behavior treading down the pasture, muddying up the waters, which really kind of shows us that these goats in this passage, for example, were not passive necessarily only. They were, in essence, creating a chaotic pasture for the sheep. And for this reason, this is why shepherds separate the sheep from the goats, is because when it comes time for them to rest, the sheep should rest among sheep because it's more peaceful, and the goats should rest among goats because they're more chaotic. So let's, that's, the, the, that's part one. Let's look at part two, least of them. Let's look at verses uh, 34 to 36. Let's read these verses uh, responsibly too. I'll go first. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now, I spent a good amount of time mentioning especially the similarities of sheep and goats. That's an important concept to understand because there's not much difference between a sheep and a goat, and there's not that much difference, per se, between those who Jesus says come and those who he says depart from. But what the difference is, is a critical, essential difference. So let's look into this. So then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And so that's, that's that come, bring, coming closer. You are, you are far, but now because you're a sheep, I'm going to bring you in close to blessing, to a kingdom, to a, a life prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In the previous passages that we studied in Matthew 25, um, Jesus used the, the, the expression, joy of your master. You know, living under Jesus' care now in his flock, in his herd, is very blessed. But the best is yet to come. Amen. Amen. The best is yet to come. Come. Come closer. You who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What a hope we have as we follow Jesus. Now he gives the reason why. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty. I was so thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Wow. Here in these verses, Jesus shares with us six needs and six deeds. I was very happy when I got knees and deeds to rhyme together. I was like, oh, that sounds good. 
I felt like Augustine, uh, you know, uh, Augustine oftentimes he comes up with, uh, uh, what, are they, what do they call those, like, acronyms, right? So I was, what about, like, 6N6D or something like that? That doesn't really flow that well, but six knees and six deeds. Let's consider these. They both have physical as well as spiritual meaning to them. So I think, you know, this, the physical is a little bit pretty obvious. So we're going to think about the spiritual meaning of these things as well. So hungry. When somebody's hungry, they're really malnourished. Their life is about to die. If you go hungry long enough, eventually you're, you're fading, and it's, you're fading towards death. Unless you get food, you will continue that de degradation into a skeleton and basically dying. Everyone needs food. With food, somebody can become strong. And without food, even a small amount of time without food, what happens to our strength? It's gone. We become weak. Many people are spiritually weak. And in a weakened state, they're easily overrun and overcome. They're hungry. They're not strong. And if they stay in this state, they will eventually die. Thirsty. Try to remember a time that you're very thirsty. I think, you know, with the, the like we have like uh, grocery stores and convenience stores and running water. So to become thirsty, it really takes a certain unique situation to find yourself in these days. But just imagine how that feels to be thirsty. All you can think about is, I want water so bad. I'm so thirsty. And that, it's very, very uncomfortable. I think it's a lot different than being hungry because you might still have your strength, but if you're thirsty, you know, you can't stand life because of the, th the thirst. You just want a drink that satisfies you, something that makes you feel better, something that alleviates this thirst inside of me. A stranger, stranger, being a stranger is very, uh, some people really do not like this feeling. The uncomfortable feeling of not belonging. To walk into a situation where everyone else feels very collected, but you're on the outside. It's not fun to be on the outside of any kind of community or group or, and not really know and be a part of something. Everyone feels a need to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Everyone feels the need to make a human connection, to be liked, to be appreciated, to be seen. To be a stranger is very uncomfortable, depressing. But to be welcomed, to be a stranger and to have somebody see you and welcome you and bring you in and say, this is who, and this is another person, and oh, here, have something. And you're like, whoa, oh, oh, okay, thank, thank you. You feel carried in to something that you couldn't go into yourself. To be welcomed. To not be judged. To be a friend to somebody and to have friends. This is so beautiful. This is an essential part of life. Naked. This one's obvious. I didn't want to show any kind of naked illustration. Uh, there, so I found some uh, naked feet. <laughs> but naked is humiliated. It's ashamed. No one likes to be naked. It also means cold, exposed to the elements. You know, in Jesus' time, um, Clothing was an important part because it's not like Southern California where, you know, for the most part, it's 72 and sunny every day. Naked is to be exposed to the elements and to be, have a lot of shame. But when somebody offers clothing, instantaneously, that's all gone. It's all alleviated. You feel covered and comfortable and 
not ashamed and exposed. Sick, you know, sick is a, is a, is a tough one because when somebody's sick, uh, you're, not, you're not supposed to, uh, you, nobody else wants to get sick, <laughs> right? Or also, you know, sick people oftentimes have people that are caring for them. But, you know, in the case of, of the sick that Jesus is saying here is that they were sick and somebody came and visited them. Now, when I was sick in the hospital, I, told, I realized I made a big, 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 big mistake. Don't ever make this mistake like I did. Don't tell people, don't visit me. <laughs> right? Let people visit you. You know, of course, my wife and kids were there, but um, there was one person uh, who broke through my, don't visit me. It was Terry. Terry visited me in the hospital. And I tell you, uh, we had a godly moment. We sat and talked for about at least two hours. And it was like Jesus' kindling of co-working between Terry and I was rekindled at, in this moment. And ever since then, we've been very tight and working good, good together. He came and visited me when I was sick. But I think one of the things about sick people is that you might think like, well, they're going to get better, you know, so. <laughs> that is, you know. But, but, but another, another thing is, another deception is that probably somebody else is visiting them, right? But that's oftentimes not the case. Prison. Uh, very similar to sick, you know, somebody who's in prison, they, they're really locked up and they can't, they're really stuck where they're at. And Jesus says that they were in prison, whether justly or unjustly is not really determined here, but they were in prison nonetheless, and somebody came and visited them. So these six needs and these six deeds are really what Jesus points out as the four, I was these six um, needs, and you provided these six deeds. This is the reason that made the sheep sheep and for the, uh, one of the reasons why Jesus said, come, you who are blessed by my Father. Now, Jesus says here, um, he associates himself with all these six uh, different needs. For I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was a stranger, I was naked, I was sick, and I was in prison. This is an important thing that when we do these things for other people, both the physical and the spiritual version, this is so essential. We're not just doing it for that person. We're doing it for Jesus because Jesus associates himself with these people, those who are in need. And so when we serve those who are in need we, and do good, as we saw in last passage, you know, really investing in, in other people to do good, we're doing it not just for them. We're doing it for the Lord. Let's look at verses 37 to 40. Um, this is when the righteous answer. Okay, let's read these responsibly too. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when, do we, and when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? There's a lot of content here, but I'm going to just focus on a couple points. The, these, um, these, uh, these servants, when they, when they uh, heard Jesus say that when, they, when you did these six, when I had these six knees and you did these six deeds, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, and then this expression pops up several times, when did we see you? When did we see you? And Jesus answers and says, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Now, we have to ask the question, why did they not see that they saw Jesus? Does that make sense? <laughs> why couldn't they... Why didn't they understand 
the times that they were doing things and seeing Jesus' needs and then satisfying it with deeds, why, did they, why were they not aware of that? Oh, Sarah. Because Jesus looked down right in front of himself. Okay, good. <laughs> well put. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that, I love that answer. You know, very, I like that because it's very, uh, sometimes um, innocence is very, um, there's a good, it's not, generally speaking, it's not good to be unaware, but sometimes it's good to not be too smart for your own good, right? So um, verse 40 says, and the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. I think that the reason why they didn't really notice what they were doing is because they were doing it for the least of these. The least of these, like if they were doing these things for a great person, they would have been, oh yeah, I remember that time, like that really famous great person and we served him. Yeah, I remember, yeah, that definitely like left an impression on me. But because they were doing it for the least of these, it didn't seem like it was that big of a deal. It didn't seem, especially in this world, that it was significant. But here in this moment, Jesus says, hey, these things that you were doing for the least, these deeds and fulfilling these needs that you were doing, this was the most significant thing you were doing the whole time. Whoa. Whoa. The thing that was not significant to them that they were wondering, when would we be doing that? Jesus shows here was the most significant thing that they were doing. This truth has the potential to really change us. But let's ask this question. Why, why are the least important? Why did Jesus value them so high? I think the, this is the, there's, I have a couple points here. The least are so important to Jesus because the situation won't change without someone's help. You know, when you're really stuck, I'm talking really stuck, your situation will keep on being the same today and tomorrow and next week and next month and next year. It will not change when you're truly stuck. But when somebody comes and helps you, it doesn't have to be that way forever. So the least are so important because their situation won't change without someone's help. The least are also so important because they need the most help. And somewhat related to that is, is this uh, point here. Basic help goes a long way with the least. You know, when somebody's strong and, and, you know, maybe they have some, like, small need and you help them, they go, oh, okay, thanks, I appreciate that. But when it comes to the least, just a little bit of tender, loving care really changes their life. You know, um, this is really the case with... Um, campus ministry you know of course it's not easy to go to the campus and then invite people to Bible study but this one invitation excuse me would you be interested in Bible study <laughs> that one how many sentences is that two sentences right two sentences two sentences Two sentences can change somebody's life completely because the lost are completely lost and they will stay lost until somebody comes with even just two sentences to change their life. It's amazing. We can see why Jesus cares about this so much. So why is it hard to see the least? I think it's, it's hard to see them. 
because the least are unconnected to personal benefits. I was thinking a lot about this as, a, as I'm sifting my heart before Jesus. Uh, I thought about this concept. You know, I'm, I was asked to give a message at ISBC, right? You can imagine that uh, I take this very seriously and I work, I've been working really hard, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But when you, I was really thinking about this, how the least are completely unconnected to personal benefit. For instance, when we have to do something that's very public, oftentimes we do it really well or we put a lot of effort into it because in some ways our reputation's on the line. There's a lot of, a lot of people that are going to notice it or, you know, and you don't even have to be proud. It's just, it's very public. But with the least... There's, there's, it, it's completely unconnected to personal benefits. There's zero personal benefits. There's not even like a concern about our, our own uh, reputation or something even positive about our own life. It's connected to any kind of personal benefit. So it's oftentimes quickly overlooked. I think also the least, they don't oftentimes ask for help. You know, I was thinking about this, too. You can decide if you agree or not. But people that ask for help are actually pretty, um, asking for help is a skill. Do you agree? The fact that you even know you need help and the fact that you're even skilled to, to acquire help, that's a kind of a, a type of talent is to like, be like, hey, I need help. Can you help me? And then almost like arrange the help or organize the help in order to, like, the least can't oftentimes don't even ask for help. They can't even ask for help. They don't, they're, they're so least that they can't even communicate that. I think um, lastly, I think this is the last point about the least, is that they seem that they should be taking care of themselves. This one's a very de- a big deception. Sometimes the least, when you look at them, you think to yourself, well, you know, they probably need help, but they should probably be helping uh, they shouldn't need help. Does that make sense? They, I think Hebrews does a good example of this. In, he, in the book of Hebrews, the, the author, we don't know exactly who it is, the author says, by now you should be teachers. <laughs> and I think sometimes towards the, the, the least, there could be this, this concept that is like, you should be somewhere else. So therefore, like, why should I help you? You should be somewhere else in, in your growth. But what I was thinking about is like, yeah, the, the author of Hebrews said that, but what did he also do? He wrote a book for those people. He took time and wrote a book for the people who should be teachers by now, and he wrote a book, a fantastic book of the Bible to inspire them. Because even though they shouldn't need help, but still they need help. So sometimes the least seem that they should be taking care of themselves, um, but really they, they still need help. And that's not an excuse to not, to not invest in them. So All right, there's a couple more points. I, I, really, I really thought deeply about the least, so I'm, but I'm going to skip some. I'm going to get to my testimony about this real quick. So um, as I mentioned, and as I, and many know, I've, I've been working a lot for the ISBC conference, and one of the things that happened is um, I got asked to help create the, um, the keynote presentations for all eight messengers. I'm one of those messengers, right? And as I've been doing this, uh, you know, just to kind of give some uh, perspective, that's like creating uh, two months' worth of Sunday worship service messages. But what's interesting is that it's actually harder because I have to look carefully at their manuscript and then understand what they're trying to communicate, translate that into some kind of a visual representation. And there was one messenger in particular who really is the least of the messengers. Now, outwardly, you might not see it that way. But as I was looking through his, through his message, I thought to myself, man, why doesn't this guy, like, what? he needs to work on his message more. <laughs> and I thought to myself, why, why, am I, 
why am I helping? Lord, why? I didn't want to help this guy. I wanted to, to skim on, his, on doing the, the presentation for him because I'm like, this guy, he needs to take his message more seriously. How can I, why should I invest my time to help his message? That maybe, it seems to me that he doesn't care enough about himself to keep, you can't understand my. <laughs> but then I was also thinking about this passage and then it, the light came on. Jesus' light came on. This is the guy that's the least. He's the one that you should care the most about doing the best presentation for his message. He's the one that your help can help his message the most. Whoa. All of a sudden, my frustration just went, foo. And I was excited. He's the least. I found the least. The reason why I share this is because the least are not easy to see. I really found this out. And some of those points that I shared um, kind of like uh, show us that the least are sometimes, they're oftentimes hidden from us. But if we take to heart what Jesus is teaching us here, we can pursue, identify, and then serve the least. Because to Jesus, the least are the most important. They need the most, and our help makes the most radical difference in their life. So part three, and quickly, um, did not do it. I'm going to read these verses for us. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. It's shocking that for the goats, Jesus says here, depart from me, you cursed. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was not created or designed for mankind. But when mankind practices the very things that devil, the devil and demons do, humans get associated with them and end up going to the same place as them. Eternal fire is the place that's been prepared for all those who do not love good and do not practice good, but instead are, are self-seeking and selfish. Now, Going back to the main point, goats and sheep look very similar. But the differences between a goat and a sheep is critical. So what is the difference? Jesus says here, and he says many many times here, um, he uses the expression, gave me no, gave me no, did not, did not, did not. The real difference between a sheep and a goat according to this passage, is what somebody did or did not do. Verses 44 to 46. Let's read 44 to 46 responsibly. I'll go first. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Last week we saw the, the parable of the um, the parable of the talents, and in that parable, um, I, I associated, I kind of went on a limb, but I felt felt good about it. The saying that the, the gold talents represent one's ministry. Um, as I talk to people, especially after the message, I, I want to add to that. It's, not, it's, it's, it's our ministry, but also I want to add on to it's the good that we can do in this life. Our goal that we invest, that we put to use, that we do not put in the ground, of course, and, just, and, and not act on it, this is the good that we can do to others in this life. It's our ministry. And, and that's exactly what the, these people say. Uh, 
Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Ministry, doing good to other people. It's so important. It's, it's the difference between what sheep do and what goats do. I also, based on last week's passage, want to highlight one more thing, and, and we're wrapping up here. But um, I don't think it was insignificant that last week God really helped us to see what, what God had done through Jason and many other servants about the $3,500 um, that was provided for, um, for uh, financial support for, to go to ISBC. I think it's very important for us to really take to heart this truth. That, if Jason didn't take the initiative, initiative, that $3,500 would not exist. The good that that is going to do towards other people is now in existence. But if, that, if he didn't do that, and if the other servants who supported our, our yard sale didn't serve, then that good would just have never happened in this world. And I think it's a deception. It's a massive deception, in fact, to think, well, God's sovereign. He'll just do whatever he, he'll, he'll, he'll make up for. If we, don't, if we don't do the good that we're supposed to do in this world, well, you know, he'll figure it out. I think that that is such a massive deception. God's will is definitely going to be done in this world. But the fact of the matter is, is that there will be real suffering that ends because of our actions. And there is going to be real suffering that will continue to exist when Christians are inactive in doing the good that they're supposed to do. There's real consequences, and there's real agency on our part. And Jesus really hammers home this point in verse 44. Then he will answer them saying, truly, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. The least are so important to see them and to serve them. Once again, there's the least had, um, there was six deeds and, uh, or six needs and then six deeds that we saw in today's passage. This is what the least are. The least are hungry. The least are thirsty. The least are a stranger. The least are naked. The least are sick. And the least are in prison. May God bless us to see these six categories of the least. And most importantly, most essential, the true difference between a sheep and a goat, when we see these least and their needs, may God help us. I really, 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 really pray this, that we will do something about it. That's today's passage. And this is the conclusion of... Jesus' five discourses. I want to end with this one word, mercy. All these points, all these sheep, goats, all the explanation, it all comes down to this one word, mercy. And our Lord Jesus, the good shepherd, the king says, I desire mercy. I desire mercy. And if you know uh, or don't know, we're not using mercy in the terms of like somebody offends you and like, okay, I'm going to have mercy on you. I'm not going to punch you as, I sh as you deserve. <laughs> we're not talking about that kind of mercy. We're talking about the kind of mercy that when you're driving and you see somebody's tire blow up and then they pull over the side of the road, you see that need and you go, you know what? I'm not going to keep on driving. I'm going to pull over and have mercy and see if I can help them. That's the kind of mercy that we're talking about in this, this passage. To see the need 
And then most importantly, to do something about it. Let's read the key verse together and finish. Let me pull it up here. Okay, let's go. Then the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, um, thank you so much for Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful word. Your parable is so clear and amazing. Um, you don't leave, you don't make it ambiguous at all. You really help us to see that when we see needs and then we do something about it, it really means a lot to you. It's as if we're doing it for you. Um, Thank you so much that you clearly share that uh, this is what the kingdom of heaven is all about. It's about love, mercy, seeing and doing something and really changing um, frustration and lost conditions, hunger, thirst, all six of the conditions we saw in today's passage and changing it into um, uh, really a beautiful resolution. Um, May you just help us to practice all these things, to do what you do. And as you showed us uh, through your life and ministry, may we also practice in our life and ministry. Thank you so much for uh, carrying us through um, all five of your sermons in Matthew's gospel. Uh, Lord, please um, bless the the remaining um, direction that you've given us, especially uh, may you bless um, our baptism uh, next week and uh, grant us your word through that passage. And um, just help us to retain everything that we learned in these five discourses from Matthew's gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.